Good morning, Hope. Welcome to our Christmas worship celebration, which is one of my personal favorites because Dave lets me sing Christmas carols all morning. So please feel free to jump in, join along, stand up as we worship the baby. Go tell it on the mountain. Good morning, Hope. Morning. Merry Christmas. Uh, welcome to our Hope family Christmas celebration. Thank you guys so much for coming today. A couple of quick com commercials before the announcements. We have nursery available at the end of the hallway next to the green room, and we have Sunday school for our children out in the back, in the buildings in the backyard. In your bulletin, get a bulletin. There's a lot of good information in there. Get one outside. There's a very brightly colored card. Fill it out. This is our communication card. This is so we know who you are when you're here, how we can pray for you. And there is a spot if you want to keep it confidential. We'll just give it to Stan and let him look at it. This is how you can communicate with our staff. Now on to the commercials. On the ministry table outside, there are, it's got all of our happenings, everything that we have going on out there. And we do have a new ministry that is looking for a few committed men. There's a sign-up sheet out there. It's Beacon, so go and look out there at it. Also coming up, we have our three favorite peas and the prayer chain the prayer chain is january 4th and 5th hope prays for 24 hours straight for whatever is on your heart um we'll start on the fourth and all through the night all day all through the night and then on the fifth we're going to meet in the evening at six o'clock for pizza praise and prayer so sign up out there. It's a great time. It is a fantastic 
experience. And now we're going to get up and say Merry Christmas to at least three people. Good morning. So, the coolest thing I think about our church is literally the meet and greet when I get to hear everybody, just the fellowship and the friend making right now. It's, it's almost like I don't even really want to get up here and play. I want to hear just the friendship and the fellowship. So what we're going to do right now um, is right where you are, wherever you're standing, whatever you're doing, we're all going to just turn around and just enjoy to the Lord. You ready to do this? Yeah. Let's do it. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing joy to the world the savior reigns let men their songs employ while fields and clouds rocks hills and plains repeat the sounding joy repeat the sounding joy repeat repeat the sounding joy he rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders, wonders of his love. You sound great, Hope. That was beautiful. What key is that? Oops.
your baby boy but someday walk on water Mary did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new this child that you delivered Soon deliver you. Mary didn't know that your baby boy would give sight to a blind man. Mary did you know that your baby boy would calm a storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby Mary was the first of three, long black hair and sugar sweet. Daddy's eyes and mama's crooked smile. She was barely 17, got a job keeping dishes clean. Planned to stay in the city for a while. Joseph ran the lumber yard about a mile from all apart. Quiet boy never had much to say. It was love right from the start. But a ring won Mary's heart. Hopes for a plan. Get some. Angel scared her half to death. She would have screamed, but she lost her breath on a midnight there in the middle of May. She said, Oh, Mary, don't be afraid. Bear a son that the Lord has made. Name him Jesus. He'll light the way.
packed your clothes, you made the plan. You had to go to Bethlehem, but there was nowhere left to stay. So in a barn, she gave birth to the King of Kings, the Lord of Earth. Just a little bitty thing sleeping on the hay, sleeping on the hay. Story's much too long to tell, but he walked on water and lived through hell. Killed on a cross, rose from the grave. He got a king, they got a son. Mary and Joseph were the only ones. And on that very first Christmas day. They're on that very first Christmas day. Today, we celebrate the birth of Christ, the light born into a very dark place, the hope of the world. And at this time in our service, as we take communion, we remember the baby that grew up and lived a sinless life, taught us how to love, and showed us what love looks like by giving his life for us killed on a cross, the baby who came to save us died for us. And as you take communion this morning, I encourage you to think about that sacrifice, the love poured out for you. Traveled from afar, hoping to find a child from hell. They falling on their knees, they bowed before the humble and so We bring an offering of worship to No one on Deserves the praises that we sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due.
Hey, Hope Church, second service, you glad to be here today? Yeah. Amen. It's good to see all of you. We wish you a very Merry Christmas. And thank you if you're joining online and, and in our worship celebration on the grid. We're glad that you're with us. Um, let's give it up for the most dangerous uh, worship band on the West Coast, Hope Rising. Thank you, gang. After services, I'll be a little aloof from you all. I've, I've got some nasty bug that's been going around. You know, the Bible says they had all things in common, uh, but I don't think you want this bug that I got. Besides, you go to church and get sick from your pastor, that's got to suck, right? And so, <laughs> anyway, mental hugs to everybody and a very Merry Christmas. Um, if, if you look inside the bulletin, we've been putting down uh, where we're at in our regular tithes and offering. Uh, last month we did better, and I want to thank everybody for that. I know you're doing the best you can. Uh, also, you can see this month we're lower, we're about round half. There's a board on the hallway uh, where uh, Gina did a great job of showing, giving you kind of a view of where everything goes, so you can look at that. And you'll notice if you look at the board, now our need is 13.5 uh, instead of 12.7, and that's because of ministry. There's no raises, no bonuses, mortgage is still the same. But it's a good problem. It's more ministry needs. And uh, so I wanted you to know about that. Um, and so you can pray about it and do what you can. The other thing, <clears throat> I told you a couple months ago, and I wanted to do it one last time before the end of the year, uh, that someone, one of our members said, for anyone who gives a $1,000 gift for the building fund, he would match that. And uh, so far, three families have given. 
$1,000. So that three went to 6000 uh, you see how I figured that out really quick? I'm good with math. And uh, so that's awesome. That if, if you're able, uh, feel free to do that. He said you can only give one gift of a thousand. Uh, you can't give multiple, but you could like give it to someone else and they could give it. I was thinking, but no. I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway, um, I want to echo Meg a little bit about the prayer chain because, like she said, it's always awesome. God does something special every time we do it. It also bonds us. If you did, if you've never done it, it's pretty cool praying around the clock and getting a call from one of your brothers and sisters at Hope and they say, have a great time with the Lord. And then you do your 30 minute segment and then you call someone that's next to you on the list and you say, have a good time with the Lord. And then we gather together the next day at six for the three Ps. And, and it's always a great time of fellowship. But I like this one because it's the beginning of the year and it's a great time to thank God for what he's done in the past year and pray for the upcoming year. Even if you had a tough year I know God's not through with you. You know why? You're still here. He's not done with you. You're vertical. And so uh, you want to thank God and, and then look ahead. I don't like to make a plan and then say, God, bless my plan. I like to say, God, lead us. Open the doors that you want us to walk through. I want to get in on what God is blessing, not just ask him to bless what I want to do. I want to get in on what he's blessing. Do surfers make waves? No, they hunt and look and find the waves. Only God makes the waves, and they ride what God does. That's what we want to do in a prayer chain, is ask God to open doors for us and lead us into this new year. Well, um, I read an article this week by a guy who said, we possibly understand more now what it was like for Mary and Joseph in the, in the birth of Christ uh, in, in the last 10 years because of the images we've seen through war in the Middle East uh, we understand probably better what it was like more than a hundred years or so because we can see these images so easily now in the news. And he talked about uh, an image that hit him uh, a few years ago. He saw a woman and a, a man fleeing from Iraq and they were refugees and the woman was pregnant and on a donkey and she had her little cart that she would sleep on. She had pots and pans and her precious possessions that she could bring and food and then the man was anxiously leading his family out trying to go to safety because of decisions that were made halfway around the world and uh, that's what it was like the first Christmas uh, Mary and and Joseph were leaving a place they were going uh, to their hometown to Bethlehem because of attacks because of something that had been called because of a decision that had been made and then they're ultimately going to have to be refugees and go to Egypt because of the threat of murder from King Herod. They would be refugees and end up in Egypt where they'd be accepted. Bethlehem was the place of birth, but it was only a stopping point for registration in the birth. Uh, then they would move on. They may have met thieves along the way. That happens now in places of the world where thieves will, will make people pay and then they may let them move on. Uh, we do know it was a dangerous time, and uh, this was not random. The place that Jesus was born and the way that he was born wasn't by accident. It wasn't by random. God was behind it. It was from a force of God behind them. You might say the force was with them. Um, even though there was danger around, people would come to understand that this king, this different kind of king, Messiah, has come for us. You have tribal chiefs mentioned in the Bible. In Luke 2, we don't have it on your outline, but it's in the context of a verse we're going to look at in a minute. It says, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. And a little later in chapter 3, verses 1 and 3, it says, in the 15th year, of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Eturia and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. That's not Abilene, Texas. Uh, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. These tribes are descendants of I I Isaac, the Tribes of Iraq are descendants of his brother Ishmael. Both are sons of Abraham. But the promise 
uh, given, the Messiah promise was given through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, that family tree. And um, there was, just as there's international forces sometimes that come together to fight a, a common enemy in the world, it was similar that, similar that way when Jesus was born. The Romans would bring in people uh, from different countries, conquered countries, and put them in to march with their empire. And at the time of Jesus, there's foot soldiers that were Huns and Gauls and Kurds and Syrians, Picts and Celts. And this was a northern alliance that marched all over Judea under Roman leaders. The decisions were made far away in the center of a vast empire. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Ordinary people, like the carpenter of Nazareth, are fleeing on donkeys because of decisions made a half a world away. This was the world into which Jesus was born. Now, the birthplace of Jesus in Bethlehem was most likely a cave. Uh, caves are still in the mid Middle East in the, in the hillsides, and they were used for animals. They were used for storage. They were used for living space. And so it's not an accident that he's born in this place. Um, he's come for us in a new way, and God, th that he was born in this way is significant. It was not the innkeeper's fault that there was no room in the inn. That was all part of the plan of God. The shepherds were told, and I think you have this on the back of your bulletin, this day, this very day in David's town, your Savior was born, Christ the Lord, and this is what will prove it to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. It's called David's town. David was born there, and David would uh, frequently go there and use Bethlehem, which is south of Jerusalem. And David was, prof it was prophesied to David that through his family tree, a Messiah, a Savior would come. And so they're part of that lineage of David, and they're coming to their hometown, and the shepherds are told, you're going to find a Savior who's born in this manger. He's, he's come for us. And the proof was a baby wrapped in cloth lying in a manger. It's 750 years after a prophecy by a guy named Micah that foretold that the ruler of Israel would come uh, from Bethlehem, and that is unfolding, and it's happening. And they forgot about that prophecy, but some astrologers would come along from the east following a star and ask King Herod about it because they knew about that prophecy. The scripture nowhere mentions a stable, just a manger. The church of the nativity in Bethlehem is built over a cave that was identified in the second century as the birthplace of Jesus. The birthplace of Jesus in such a place is not an accident. A damp, dirty cave, the smell of manure, the sound of animals. And he came as a king, but a different kind of king. And I want to show you four signs that this birth that took place in this cave, there's four signs from that. One is a sign of poverty. The coming of, the, of Jesus born in a cave, in a manger, a feeding trough, is a sign of poverty. No birth could have so identified with the poor than the birth of Jesus. We spend billions of dollars to celebrate the birth of Christ, but Jesus was born in surroundings that were only for the absolutely poor. God cares for the poor. God identified himself with the poor when he first came, when he first sent his son, and he was born in a cave. His whole life would be a life of poverty. He goes around doing ministry, and uh, he he's, has no, no place to lay his head, he says himself. His coat was his coat during the day, his blanket at night. And uh, friends would share homes with him or different things, but he just went around this preacher who, who lived in poverty. When he was presented in the temple as a baby, which is what they did, kind of like a dedication, um, the parents offered a dove sacrifice, which is the gift of the poor. As a workman in Nazareth, he spoke about patches and garments and women sweeping the house to find a little coin 
and having to borrow food when unexpected guests arrived. That was everyday illustrations Jesus used from growing up in this life of a peasant. As a preacher, he owned nothing, uh, but he gave and he gave and he gave, and he had nowhere to lay his head. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, Our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become come rich. He has come for us. He has come for us. You're not too poor for Jesus. Uh, some people categorize people based on their net worth, how much money they have, what they look like, right? Christians never do that, right? We, we don't know any Christians, but you probably know somebody who's not a Christian that does that, right? Or we say, so what do you do? And we categorize a person based on what they do. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus loves everybody, and he came for all. It's interesting, by the way, when you read the lineage of Jesus, you find some, some people with a past in his family tree. And it's not just to prove to us that he came from the right prophecy, the right family tree. That's part of it. But it also says to us he came for everybody. Those shepherds were peasants. They were poor. They lived out in the cold, out in the dark. And this, they're, they're, going, they're sent to go see the Savior of the world. If you're having a hard time, if your dreams have been dashed, things haven't gone as you had hoped, you're feeling poor, know this today, that that baby born in that cave is a sign that he came for you, for me, for all of us. Maybe you got lots of stuff, financially, resources, but you got a void in your heart. That's called poverty of spirit. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. You're in the right place to accept the gift of the baby who was born in the cave in a manger. A second sign, not only is it a sign of poverty, it's a sign of his humility. Humility. A birthplace in a manger shows a character trait that marked Jesus all his life, his humility. The life of Jesus helped change the world's attitude towards humility. What was considered a weakness in men is now considered an essential for greatness. He turned the world's thought of greatness upside down with, with humility instead of power and might and manipulating others. You know, when I first went to preacher school, I got this book called The Man of Steel and Velvet. And that's what the guy talked about, that being a, a Jesus man means that you don't bully people around, but that you humble yourself. And I've noticed that when I don't humble myself, when I use my strong personality or whatever, things don't go well, and sooner or later, I've humbled. I, I'm humbled. I've noticed that with my kids when they were little, if I sat there having a pity party in a bad mood, they didn't just walk over and say, what's wrong, Dad? Oh, poor you. Let's all gather around and sing tune by you. Poor you. <laughs> no one wants to be around someone who's prideful and arrogant. But when I would say I'm sorry or I would humble myself to them, when I'd get on the floor and look them in the eyes, or if I lost my temper and yell and said, I shouldn't have done that, it, it, it opened their hearts to me, and we have a great relationship, even now that I'm an old dude. And I learned that from Jesus. And it's ironic we can, in Christ, in church, get prideful, right? Not you, any of us, but we probably know people like that, right? We can say, this is my ministry. Do you know how long I've been doing it? This is my pew. This is my. Isn't that ironic that uh, we're following this guy, this humble guy that laid down his life, and we can get all prideful about our position, our perceived title, and it's a glaring, glaring weakness in the church when we're that way. The cool thing is, though, when you humble yourself, sooner or later, it's not always our timing. It's never our timing. It's his timing. He exalts the humble. He exalts the humble. You hang in there. You keep serving humbly. Sooner or later, he is always faithful to exist. And he says it in many places in Scripture. Talks about it in James, that God exalts the humble. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 23, 12, For whoever exalts himself will be humbled. That's a promise. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. That's a promise. The life of Jesus is the life of a great man who never exalted himself. The Apostle Paul quoted in Philippians 2, some consider it as a song, verses 6 through 8, Christ Jesus, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. That means 
to be held on to. He didn't hold on to, well, I'm deity, I'm in heaven, that's, nothing's going to change that. He didn't hold on to that. But instead, Paul writes, he but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And then God, it goes on to say that God, wherefore God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Those in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. He says angelic beings will say Jesus is Lord. Humans on earth will say Jesus is Lord. Demons under the earth will say Jesus is Lord. And he, he became Lord by humbling himself. We proud moderns can learn a thing or two from Jesus. Amen? When we get prideful, we've left the way of our leader. The greatness is seen in humbly serving others. And if I just want to say, if you're serving and you're not getting a lot of accolades or pats on the back, you just remember God sees that you're doing it. You stay in there. You're rich in heaven, and that's all that matters. Jesus talks about that, storing up riches in heaven. Human beings, we make mistakes, or we don't recognize what people are doing sometimes. Some work behind the scenes, and they, you're doing that for God, and you're following Jesus. The manger reminds us that greatness lies in humility. He has come for us. He's not a prideful guy that's in a throne saying, you better get it right. He came for us and lived humbly and said, follow me. Number three, the, the cave is a sign of his identity. The manger is a sign <coughs> of his identity. The shepherds were told that they would recognize the Savior when they found a newborn babe wrapped in strips of cloth lying in a manger that was the sign of his identity. The sign of the Savior is a feeding trough, a manger. And the reason for this runs through the Old Testament over every generation. You remember when Adam and Eve sinned, and then it talks about their son Abel. He brought a sacrifice. What kind of sacrifice? From his flock. He brought a sacrifice from the flock, and he sacrificed it as a sin offering to God. Noah took a lamb after the flood, and he he. Added after it had subsided and the animals and birds are multiplying and he sacrificed to God. Abraham built an altar and he sacrificed a ram that was provided as a sign of his dependence on God. The Israelites sacrificed lambs in Egypt and smeared the doorposts with blood so that death would pass over them when they were leaving Egypt. Moses gave the people of Israel instructions of how to sacrifice a lamb for their sins each year. And then I love this, in John 1, it says that John the Baptist sees Jesus, and when he saw him, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You kind of you wonder, what's he talking about if you don't know the history? You know, John's standing there, this guy from, from the wilderness, the total ridge guy, as we said the other day. He, he's a tough guy, and he goes, Look! He sees Jesus, this regular, ordinary carpenter from Nazareth, because look! The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. What are you talking about, John? John, when he saw him, he just didn't see Jesus. He saw the sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb. He knew the history of lambs having their throats slit and pouring their blood out. And he looked at Jesus and he saw the sacrificial lamb that has come to, to give his blood for the sins of all the world. It's a sign of his identity uh, when he's born in this feeding trough, in this manger. The prophet Isaiah had foretold that the Savior would be a, a lamb without spot and blemish as our sacrifice. 700 years, 750 years before this. I have this verse on your outline. Micah wrote, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Do not despise small beginnings. The greatest leader of all time is born in a remote little place, in a cave, uh, in a manger. You know, you never see Jesus uh, when he's out 
if not very many people are there, he never complains about attendance. You know, when he's going through Samaria, he doesn't go, there's only one woman here to talk to. He reaches out to that one person and ends up impacting her whole village. Never despise small beginnings in your life, in your relationships, in your career, in your ministry. That's where God shows up. And that's what, what he demonstrates to us in the sending of Jesus, who is our Messiah. Palaces were proper places in which princes would be born. But God sends the King of Kings, the Lamb of God, to a cave in Bethlehem. The shepherds identified with this uh, manger. They understood one thing a temple shepherd could do was recognize a sacrificial lamb. You know, archaeologists have helped us understand that when Jesus was born, they, they've discovered special fields in that area for sacrificial lambs. Lambs were sacrificed in the temple in Jerusalem for the sins of believers. They would take the firstborn of every male that was without blemish, that was healthy, and they would take it to Jerusalem to be sacrificed. And that's why these guys are at night. They're, they're watching over the flock. They're temple shepherds, poor peasants who are watching over this important job for these lambs that are going to be sacrificed. And the Ma Messiah would suffer and die as a sacrificial lamb for the sins of the world. This, uh, these fields are called Migdal Idar, which means the tower of the flock. These fields are just outside Bethlehem. Here, the temple shepherds are getting them ready for sacrifice, and they don't need a star to guide them to the cave. They know about the manger in the fields of Magdal Idar. The place of the birth tells of his death, of his identity, that he's the Messiah, and he has come for us. He has come for us. Number four, the birth of Jesus in the manger, in the cave, in this remote place, the, is, a, is a sign of his rejection. A sign of his rejection. <coughs> the story of Christmas. <coughs> has Jesus born in a manger as a lamb of God to be the savior of the world and to take away the sins of the world. This would involve sacrifice. Bethlehem cannot be understood without Calvary. The manger must be seen in the light of the cross. The birth involves dress, death. The true story of Christmas is tough and real and factual. And there's things like angels and bright stars, shepherds, wise men, yes, but there's also whips and nails and soldiers and a betrayer and thorns and a cross. Jesus was to be despised and rejected throughout his life. It says that in Luke 2, 7, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. There was no room for Jesus in the inn. And that's a symbol of what would happen his entire life, that there's no room. That's a symbol what, that still happens today. Bethlehem rejected him as a baby when Herod uh, murdered all the male children. Nazareth, his hometown, rejected him where he grew up and cast him out of their cities. He goes to this place called Decapolis. There's a guy possessed with demons. You talk about mental illness. He had a legion of demons. The guy was in horrible shape, and people didn't even want to be around him, and he uh, was naked and he cried out and gashed himself. Cutting's nothing new. He gashed himself, crying out in misery, and no one wanted to be around him. And G he met Jesus, and Jesus set him free, and Jesus healed him. And the demons went out in some pigs and ran into the water. And the people were so upset about the financial loss with the pigs, they told Jesus to leave. Leave us, Jesus. Leave us. They didn't care about this, this whole life that's been changed. They rejected the healer because of money. People still do that. People still want Jesus to leave or don't want to pay attention to Jesus. John 1, 11 says, He came to his own people, and they received him not. Israel rejected him when, they, when he wouldn't fit their concept of a military leader to throw off the Roman yoke. 
You know, I love in uh, Luke 24, I have one verse from there, but I want to talk about the context a little bit. It's pretty cool because Jesus has died on the cross. He's risen from the grave. He appears to these guys on this road, and they don't realize who it is. And he asks them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast, it says in Luke. And one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and all the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. It's kind of humorous if you think about it because they're telling Jesus about Jesus and they don't know. <laughs> and Jesus goes, yeah, I'm tracking. I got it. I got it. And then he makes this statement, uh, uh, verse 26, oh, foolish men and slow of heart, to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? You turn that sentence around, he says, it was necessary for the king, for the Messiah to suffer. It was foretold through the prophets. Uh, all these scriptures pointed to, it's all about Jesus. And they say, we're not our hearts, later when they realized it was the Lord, we're not our hearts burning within us as he opened to us the scriptures and, and and they get it that it's all about him his suffering was not accident it was all part of the plan of God for the redemption of mankind he was rejected all his life and today multitudes go on their way careless of this news that one has come into the world to redeem them and give them the free gift of sins forgiven of eternal life and hope of heaven. They remain caught in the computer bleep of million cash registers the, and the ch charging of billions of dollars to commercialism. They're too busy to see the Christ child, the hope of, man, of mankind, the purpose of his coming is lost under piles of crumbled wrapping paper and the urgency of being ready for the best Christmas sales. You know, you can actually give a present to Jesus on Christmas. And you know what it is? Just spend some time with Jesus. You know, he actually wants to spend time with you and me. Isn't that a mind blower? He wants you to just learn to hang out. The Bible says, be still and know that I'm Lord. We're so rushed during the holidays and we can just be all worn out. And, and it's a time really we, to draw near to God. Keep it simple and share love with your loved ones and spend time with the Lord. Spend time alone. He doesn't want you to go through some rituals and, and hoops. He just wants to know you and he wants you to know him. And he finds joy in that in knowing you. And that's a great Christmas present that you and I can give to Jesus this Christmas. It's his birthday, right? And so we can do that. We can reject him just like they did. You know what touches my heart when you read the end of John when he's before the high priest and they ask him about what he taught, and he goes, you know, I taught in the open. Everybody knows what I taught, and this guy hits him because he talks that way to the high priest. And Jesus says, if I'm, if I'm lying, then go ahead and strike me, but if I'm telling the truth, why do you strike me? And that, that tells me that he felt that blow to his face. It hurt. And then he goes through this terrible uh, time of them mocking him, spitting on him, punching him, beating him, stripping him, and that's just the night before, and he goes through it again with the Roman soldiers. And he's whipped, when they whipped people, the, the Jews had 39 uh, lashes, because if you went over 40, you'd be whipped. You had to be careful. The Romans had no rule of how many, and the whips sometimes had sheep's bone or stone in them, and they would whip, and sometimes people died from the whipping along. It would bruise and tear and start tearing into the tissue, and Jesus is beaten uh, and rejected by those he came to redeem. And then he's pressed uh, to take the cross beam, and it's probably just the cross beam that he's carrying to go up to the mountain. And he's lost all this blood. He's in shock, probably falls from the weight, and Simon of Cyrene takes the place to carry the cross for our Lord. They get up there, 
and they lay him down on this cross beam, and a soldier skilled in the dreadful art of finding a hole between the wrist bones hammers a nail through the wrist. And then he goes to the other side, leaving enough room for flexibility. He hammers another nail in the wrist of our Lord. And then they lift him up and set him on the upright beam. And they put one foot in front of the other and they, they hammer another nail through the feet of our Lord. I thirst, he says, fulfilling scripture. He prays for those punishing him. Father, forgive them. They just don't know what they're doing. And he's going up and down. Uh, doctors and medical experts say that uh, the, the, the pain in his feet uh, would, would hurt so bad when he pushed up, he'd come down, the pain in the nerves of his hands would shoot through his arms, explode in his brain. So he'd go back down, the pain in his feet, and he would go up and down, up and down, up and down. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He who knew no sin was made sin on our behalf. He died on the cross for our sins. Finally, his nerves would give in where he couldn't push up. He would suffocate. He would die of a broken heart. But it's not over. Amen? He would rise from the grave. You know, babies aren't threatening. I love babies. Well, they can get noisy when they're hungry, right? But Jesus didn't stay a baby. He grew up as a boat rocker, and he still is. He went around and he called people to follow and he claimed to be the way and he didn't do what everybody wanted him to do. He served God's will and then when he rose from the grave, the disciples finally had the great aha. He's the savior of the world. I pray for you to have the greatest Christmas you've ever had. I know it's a sad time for, for some people, but it doesn't have to be for you if you know Jesus. If you drive deep into this Savior who knew poverty and humility, who was the suffering Lamb of God, who was rejected for us, you can draw deep into his bosom we used to sing about when I was a kid. And I always thought, what the heck does that mean? And it's very special to me now because he's always there to take us in. Others will reject you. Some maybe will abandon you. Maybe you've been abandoned and maybe you've been beat up in life and you need to know there's this Savior who's not mad at you. He came into this world. He came for us. He came for all of us. Today can be the greatest day of your life. Give your life to Christ. Cl proclaim him as your Messiah. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the listeners that gather here. I can see in their eyes they love you and I'm so blessed to be here with them and all of us are blessed by the gift of Christmas. It was fun as kids growing up in America. We, we learned some fun things and fortunately sometimes learned to give gifts too and not just get. But it's so much deeper than commercialism, the meaning of the coming of your son. And while schools, secular schools and places are trying to take Jesus out and just talk about holidays or Charlie Brown or whatever, <laughs> I pray that our commitment will die will dive deep, rooted in that cave, in that manger, in that remote place of the world where Jesus came for all of us. Nobody's too poor. Nobody's too unattractive. You love us all, and we're all part of your family if we say Jesus is Lord. We commit to that, the Messiah. Thank you for coming for us. We pray in your name. Amen. amen. Let's stand and worship God. <coughs> Gotta rescue every gentleman and let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, God, oh, Heavenly Father, I'm a blessing.
Awesome, guys. Wow. Now it's time to pray for our offering. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you. I get to work at a church where we celebrate giving. Um, we, it's all yours anyway. There's no U-Hauls behind a hearse. We're not taking anything with us. We came here with, without anything. So, God, uh, help us to be contributors and not just consumers. Make us a force of hope on the ridge and beyond for Jesus. I pray you're in the middle of it and you're glorified by it. That's our, our hope and our aim. We pray in the name of the Messiah, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, before we give, what is our purpose? Relationships, Relationships that last forever. forever. How do we do that? Love God, love people. So remember, every single day this week in Christ, we always have hope. Thanks for being here, everybody. Amen. All right, let's have a little fun. Merry Christmas.